Oh, Kristen. Yes, David. I am so very excited to tell you that we've got our first corrective email. We sure did. Subject line, Kim Manners is a man, not a woman. Please Google it. And you know what? Now we don't have to. Well, I did, but that was correct. I believe him, but <laughs> I don't have to Google it. They told me. That's true. Also, apologies to Kim if he's listening. Uh, he's not. I mentioned he is no longer with us in that episode. Oh, did you? Yes. Hmm. Well, I Googled it, but I didn't read anything about him. Yeah, I would just like to thank this person for being polite about it. There's nothing in the body of the email. Well, do you know in the episode I mentioned reading The Pharmacology of Zombies by Wade Davis? I remember that. And then I tried to, but I couldn't because it's paywalled. <laughs> nice. But I wasn't satisfied with not Googling it further. So I Googled him and read his Wikipedia page, the scholarly journal Wikipedia. Yes. Which is free, thank you. And found the criticisms of his work in Haiti. Oh, good. Basically, his methodology behind all of this is questionable at best and worse than that at worst. <laughs> worse than that at worst. Yes, but he did write a book called The Serpent and the Rainbow, which basically... He wrote Serpent and the Rainbow. That is that is what I was thinking about the whole time I was watching this episode. Oh, okay, so you're familiar with it. I am. Well, the interesting thing is that's where this whole episode came from. Makes sense. They have tetradox... Tet Tetrodotoxin? Blech. Okay, well, I do that in the episode, too, so I just, I'm staying on brand. I don't know how to say this word. <laughs> I edited it out in the episode. Ah, uh, well, there you go. Well, um, so in his hypothesis, he's saying that TTX, poisoning, could explain the existence of Haitian zombies. That seems like it has no scientific basis, but uh -huh. biochemist Jessica Jake has noted that bromism, bromism? may also be at play in the symptoms of Haitian-specific zombies. Okay. So, bromism is the Believe syndrome... it's called bromances. Bromances <laughs> is the syndrome which results from the long-term consumption of bromine, usually through bromine-based sedatives such as potassium bromide and lithium bromide. It was once a very common disorder being responsible for five to ten percent of psychiatric hospital admissions hmm. so this is an actual thing okay and uh the other toxin the ttx was found in minute amounts in some of the stuff that they tested from davis's work so it wasn't something that he made up completely but it does sound like maybe he oversold it but the bromism is an actual thing. And there was a man named Clarvis, Clair, Clarvius Narcissi. He was a Haitian man who claimed to have been turned into a zombie by a Haitian voodoo and forced to work as a slave. On his account during his release, he reported that the master's wife fed salt to the enslaved and set them free. Administering sodium chloride helps the body excrete bromide and thus is a known treatment for bromism. <laughs> wow. Symptoms of bromism include stupor, slurred speech, abnormal gait, and other symptoms described in zombie folklore, such as, quote, behavior that can become violent, especially at night, unquote, skin rashes, and enlarged pupils. Huh. Further investigation into the bromide source, which may be as simple as the use of bromide salts when preparing food for the enslaved, should be addressed. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Wow, that's a lot. It is. So I couldn't read that one article, but I found out where zombieism, what's causing zombieism, apparently. Fantastic. Amazing. So that was worthwhile. Great. Do you have anything else from this episode that you've discovered? I, nothing that's going to top that. All right. I mean, I did just explain zombies, so. Yeah. Okay. Enjoy. <laughs> Greetings, listeners, domestic, international, and extraterrestrial. I'm Dave Reed. And I'm Kristen Riley. And this is The Cast Files. I am a nerd who has somehow never seen The X-Files. And I watched it when it originally aired. The Cast Files is a podcast where we watch and discuss every episode of The X-Files spoiler-free. Today, we are talking about Season 2, Episode 15, Fresh Bones. <laughs> it originally aired February 3rd, 1995. It was written by Howard Gordon not Alex Ganza, and directed by Rob Bowman, 
It's his fourth. He is also the director of Airborne, the rock and roller blade movie. <laughs> oh starring gosh. Seth Green and Shane McDermott and a young Jack Black. Wow. All right. So for the cast, we have some repeat X-Filers again. We have Callum Keith Rennie. He is the groundskeeper who previously played Thomas Phillips in the X-Files episode, Lazarus. Recognized him right away. We have another person from Lazarus. Peter Kelamas, he is Lieutenant Foyle. He previously played Odell in Lazarus. Odell? It's a last name. Okay. And Katya Gardner, Robin McAlphin, previously played Peggy Odell in the X-Files episode, Pilot. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. Peggy O'Dell and Pilot. Yep. All right. We also have guest stars Bruce Young as Pierre Beauvais, Daniel Benzali as Colonel Jacob Wharton, Jamil Walker Smith as Chester Bonaparte. We should look up Jamil Walker Smith to see if he. Oh, no, not Jamil. Um, who am I thinking? Oh, Harry Dunham. So we have Matt Hill oh, yeah. as <laughs> Private Harry Dunham, and then Stephen Williams as. Eh. I'm going to look up, oh, not Jamil. Jamil's awesome, but I'm going to look up Matt Hill to see where he's actually from. Oh, Canada. <laughs> Interesting. Not New Orleans. Shocking. We couldn't tell. Uh, Matt Hill was born in North Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. However, we are supposed to believe that he is from New Orleans, and um, he, he tries about 15% of the time. A little bit. <laughs> You want to see what Bruce Young's in? He is Beauvais. Oh, let's see. Nothing. This page gives me nothing. How did you feel about this episode? Uh, better than a long stretch we've had. Same. There is a lot of racism and xenophobia in this. I'm conflicted on how I'm supposed to feel about that because they definitely don't get voodoo right. I'm sure of it. Not that I know. <laughs> Shocking. I, not that I'm an expert on voodoo, but they also really... I think they're on the side that the army is bad and that the refugees are fine. I think so too, but then later you at at one point you made a comment and I was like, "Huh?" And so we'll get there. Okay. All right. The broadcast and reception, Fresh Bones was the highest rated episode of the first two seasons. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. I it get, was a good one. I guess America likes voodoo. Yep. <laughs> That's my take, take away from that. <laughs> How did Chris Carter feel about this episode? He loved it. He thought it was the best episode that they've ever done, up to date. Series creator Chris Carter called the episode one of the ones he was most proud of from the second season. <laughs> yep, see? Stating that Gordon did a good job with the script and Bowman did a great job with the directing. Basically, he could we could just copy and paste that into every single... Yes. Oh, whatever. Okay, how did the AV Club feel about this episode? They were mixed. So, Emily... Vanderwarf of the AV Club gave the episode a C uh -huh. and wrote that, quote, the biggest problems here are the lack of focus and the chaotic pacing. The episode rumbles along in first gear for about three quarters of its running time and then abruptly shifts into high gear at the end, moving toward an apocalyptic finish that doesn't feel wholly earned. There's good stuff in Fresh Bones, but the bulk of the episode disappoints, unquote. I don't agree with that. Yeah. I think you kind of have to rumble along to a big finale if you're going to set up. I didn't mind it. I didn't mind the pacing. Me <laughs> and my amateur self. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The synopsis. After several murders occur within a Haitian refugee camp, Mulder and Scully are caught in the middle of a secret battle involving a voodoo priest and a camp commander. Um, no, that's, really? That's not accurate. <laughs> They're caught in the middle of a camp commander abusing a bunch of people. Yes. All right. Right off the bat, we have a trigger warning. So trigger warning, suicide. If this is something that you do not want to listen to or you're not ready for or you just want to skip it, that's absolutely fine. This whole episode really does come back to this, though. So if it's something that makes you uncomfortable, just skip this one completely. In Folkestone, North Carolina, we open on the happiest of homes. Yeah, it's great. Jack is vomiting in the bathroom. His wife is scared of him, and the baby is crying. Just a good, classic morning. Jack just wants to eat his breakfast in peace. But the mealworms didn't get the message. And the baby is crying a lot. Baby is just crying, crying, crying. It's disturbing how 
bad this baby is crying because it's not acting because it's a friggin' baby. Oh my gosh. The most horrifying scene in this whole episode is this very opening shot, the, the cold open, where the mom is holding the baby and the baby's just sitting there being a baby and not crying. And then Jack yells at her and she starts crying and you see the baby look at her crying and yeah. he starts crying. It's, and it's oof. I just want to steal that baby away from set and go get it some ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot. And this is how you know that there's something very wrong going on in this town because an army guy can't be a bad guy. Not army, marine. Marine guy can't. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Somebody's going to be mad in the comments. You know how all the Marines listen to yes. us. <laughs> Marines train you how to kill. Army teaches you how to die. Is that I, how it's... I've known Marines. Yes, that's what they say. Wow. But the Marines go in first to die. No, uh, they're the trained ones. Hmm. Okay. McAlphin, an agitated Marine Corps private, drives his car into a tree after several hallucinatory episodes and is apparently killed. I love, I love apparently. Apparently. Uh, on the tree is a veve. On a, the tree is my next tattoo. <laughs> a drawn voodoo religious symbol. And I did look up how to pronounce this, so if I have gotten it wrong, then I misinterpreted how to pronounce it. But veve looked like how it was. Oh, this it's a real thing? Yeah. Okay, it's not my next tattoo then. Yeah, no. <laughs> I know you said that and I was like, Ugh. So from Wikipedia, a veve is a religious symbol commonly used in different branches of voodoo throughout the African African diaspora, such as Haitian voodoo. Veves should not be confused with the patipembas used in Palo, nor the pontos riscados used in Umbanda and Quimbanda, since they are separate African religions. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. So don't get this tattoo I... on your white ass body. <laughs> My lily white ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was very interesting, and I'm curious to... I didn't look up pictures of it. I'm curious how accurate the X-Files decided to go with this, or if they're just like... That's why I assume they just made this thing up. Yeah, I'm curious. But, yep, it's it's part of a religious practice. Not to be confused with other religious practices. McAlpin is the second purported suicide among troops stationed at the INS compound processing refugees from Haiti. So Fox Mulder and Dana Scully visit the compound to investigate McAlpin's death. Do we know why they're called? Somebody called and said it's a it's voodoo? Uh, the... The wife. Yeah, the wife. That's right. Oh, and what's-his-face from New Orleans told her that it was voodoo. Then she finds that awesome shell. Yes. USO.org by Danielle DeSimone. Suicide rates among active duty military members are currently at an all-time high since record-keeping began after 9-11 and has been increasing over the past five years at an alarmingly steady rate. And I know that we keep bringing this up and it's not a fun thing to note, but it's important because our whole country is pushing people into the military without acknowledging these statistics. And we need to realize that although all of the Marvel movies are big, beautiful advertisements for joining the military, <laughs> people are dying. Yeah, uh, it's one of the reasons we don't have universal health care and we can't go to college for free because then who would join the military? Nobody. There's no reason to. Then why? how could we justify our gigantic military budget? We couldn't. It's literally a machine that's built around... Making Raytheon trillions of dollars. Well, I was going to say um, keeping people going into the military. The reason behind that is to make Raytheon trillions of dollars. And calling it volunteer. Yes. You have no option for um, living above the poverty level unless you join. So, you know, volunteering. Yeah. Hooray. But let's get back into this. And we're going to meet one of my favorite characters of the episode, Chester Bonaparte. Chester Bonaparte. There, a young boy at the, they are being the compound. A young boy, Chester Bonaparte, sells a good luck charm to Mulder. This scene is amazing. Mulder does great. Chester does great. Chester is what, like 12? Maybe. They say he's 10, but this actor's not 10. Okay. So he's 12, but he's playing 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mulder has a really good episode, actually. He does. In my opinion. I agree. He starts out being nice to this kid. I'll buy your trinket. Yeah. For $5, not 10. The funny thing was, yeah, the kid was like, you should buy this. It's 5 No, $10. <laughs> and that's when Mulder's like, 
I'll give you five. And the kid's face, I need to look up to see if this kid's said anything else because he was awesome. His face is like, dang it, why did I say that out loud? <laughs> it's really good. So they do that. Oh, the reason that they're buying the good luck charm is because someone at the compound comes up to Scully and scares her a little bit and the kid chases him off. And it seems like it's probably a whole setup, but it's Oh, a... it's not. Ooh. Gosh, oh, it... you missed something at the end. Hmm. At the end of the yeah, we'll episode? Come, yeah, we'll come back to this scene later. Okay. All right. Well, I missed something, so we'll see. After meeting with Colonel Wharton, which is where they go next, Colonel Wharton is the head of the compound, Mulder meets with an imprisoned refugee, Pierre Bouvet. Bouvet is the supposed instigator of riots. Yeah, they call him the instigator. Yeah. Because these people have nothing to be angry about. Right. It's always a riot when the people who are angry have a reason to be angry. Yes. And if the people who are angry have no reason to be angry, they call it a convoy, even if it's a Nazi occupation of Ottawa. Yes. And uh, we also meet an associate of McAlpin's, Harry Dunham, which is where you said... Yeah, this guy is supposed to be from New Orleans. He is from the geographical center of Ohio. <laughs> But apparently Canada. Yeah. But it was really funny because when he was talking, we were both like, wait a sec. We were literally confused knowing that he was supposed to be from New Orleans and listening to him speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, 15% of the time he tried. This is where Mulder goes in to meet Beauvais in the, the cage that he's in. And it is peak X-Files lighting. <laughs> it's so dark. We get the... Something lit in the background, just barely, and then part of their face, usually the lower part of their face, so you can see their mouth while they're speaking, is lit. The rest, dark. Peak X-Files. Uh, at this point is when Scully is trying to autopsy McAlpin's body because they collected him from the car, of course, as you would, and somebody mentioned that his head was hanging on like a peen. <laughs> <laughs> was unnecessary language <laughs> hanging on like a broken peony <laughs> which is the state flower of indiana so i am offended are you yes scully is trying to autopsy McAlpin's body she goes down to the morgue and talks to whoever's in the morgue the guy opens the morgue case what are those things called a morgue case okay I opens so. opens the morgue case and there is a mummified dog carcass yeah i guess it's supposed to be a dog it's a big dog dogs are big mm -mm. <laughs> no <laughs> okay never mind what do you think it is a bear <laughs> yes it's a small bear no such thing as a big dog it's a small bear okay it's a dog it's a dog carcass it's it's looking rough. And so that obviously sets off a, um, a cascade of people yelling about other things. Who's been in here? This is... What kind of a joke is this? It would be a sick joke. Yeah, it's pretty messed up. Because imagine... Okay, put yourself in the place of this quote-unquote jokester. Okay. You go into the morgue. You steal into the morgue. You've rolled a 20 stealth. Nice. You steal into the morgue to kidnap a dead body whose peen is hanging off like... <laughs> like a broken flower. <laughs> his head is hanging by a thread off his neck, and of course he would be naked. So you're carrying this naked body of a guy who's probably the same size as you. Mm -hmm. Without the fluids, though, so much lighter. I, but have they drained him yet? I don't know. She's going to do the autopsy, so I don't know that they've drained him yet. I think you kind of drain on your own after you die. No, your <laughs> your blood still stays in your veins unless they put a little spigot in you. Not if you're bleeding to death. Well, at some point you stop bleeding to death because when your heart stops, you're not you only leak if you're like tipped a certain way. There you go. So then he's carrying this body with blood in it, and it's just tipping, and he's spilling blood <laughs> out of the open <laughs> neck wound onto the floor so then he muscles this guy that's the same size of him out of this place and has to clean up all of the fluids that have now 
gotten all over the board. And then he has to come back and put a mummified dog in there. It's a it's an elaborate prank. It's what a jokester. Pretty good one. He got him good. He really did. He really uh, messed up everybody's day. So Scully leaves the morgue because she's not going to autopsy a dog and goes to the cell where Mulder and Beauvais are. It's incredibly cold on Beauvais' side. I don't know if you noticed that. You cannot see Mulder or Scully's breath during this whole scene, but you can see his breath the entire time. Oh, wow. No, I didn't catch that. So they they talk. This is where Beauvais says the body was missing, right? And Scully's like, how did you know? And he's like, because I am magical. Because the spirits told him. I'm, I'm not a problematic caricature in the 90s. And now? <laughs> is it, though? Do you know enough about voodoo? Do they talk to spirits in voodoo? Is this an accurate portrayal? No, I'm not talking about voodoo. I'm talking about the magical black man trope. Gotcha. But he's also a voodoo priest. So is it accurate? This is the X-Files, so no. So, no. They, they, <laughs> they are so careful with their portrayals. They really are not. <laughs> well, Beauvais knows about it, and what he says is that they only warn you once. The Loa. The Loa, yes. Only warn you once, which I think is not enough. I think it's nice that they at least warn you. I think, okay, you warned me once. I don't believe you because I don't believe in the spirits. Then you do something that's like a light punishment so that it proves that the spirits are true and real. Then that's the second warning. Then, okay. I think you're... Look, the spirits are like, look, you're wrong because we exist and that's on you. But we're going to give you one chance. Oh, you still don't believe us? We don't have any more time for this. Are you kidding? We're spirits for eternity. We got shit to do. Hmm, You sound like a Christian right now. Do I? Yeah. We warn you once. We are the only way, and you will burn in hell for eternity if you don't believe us. That does sound Christian. Yeah. I didn't say anything about hell, though. I just said what the spirits were going to be like. Punish. Punishment. They're, yes. Yeah. They're busy. I don't have any room for either group. No. Prove you're real, or fuck off. I don't take any of this on faith. Okay. While driving down the road, Mulder and Scully discover a still-living McAlpin. Remember? Whose head was hanging on like a broken peony earlier. So was that guy lying, or did he heal up magically? Unclear. We never come back to this. Nobody asks any questions. Because we do clear up that he wasn't actually dead. He was, like, bufo-toxined to appear like he was dead. But if his head is hanging on by a thread, how do you appear to have your head hanging on by a thread? I have no idea. Maybe the other guy was hallucinating? Maybe he was also... I guess... Because we're going to get into hallucinations in a bit. Yeah, I... I, I don't know. But uh, McAlpin doesn't remember, so he can't tell us how his head got back on his body, and nobody else bothers to ask. Yeah. At first, he doesn't talk at all, because he's just a zombie. He's true. just sitting there as a zombie. That's true. And we find the trodotoxin, first try, uh, a chemical Mulder believes is part of a Haitian zombification ritual. It's found in McAlpin's blood. And um, I did a science corner before I watched this, but Scully tells us what it is. It is an extremely potent poison that is found mainly in the liver and sex organs of some fish, such as pufferfish, globefish, and toadfish, and also some amphibians, octopus, and shellfish species. Do you think it's in those frogs? No, the frogs have the bufotoxin oh, that right. is chemically similar to the chemically similar to trototoxin. Ah, uh, and I forgot to read the pharmacolo- the pharmacologically. The pharmacology of zombies by Wade Davis that they mention. Oh man. Did we find out that that guy's real? I thought you looked him up and couldn't find him. Yeah, he's real. He wrote this okay. paper. I remember you saw like a figure skater or something called Wade Davis. Yeah, I just needed to put in a uh, zombie or something yeah. and found him. And <laughs> what I said was, how white is this guy? Wade? Yes. <laughs> He's as white as his name. So the agents go to a local graveyard to investigate the corpse um, of the other dead soldier, because remember, we had two here. And they find the grave robbed. Literally, like the coffin's gone. They just took everything. Which yeah. isn't usually how grave robbing works. Yeah, I'm not sure. The coffin might have been smashed over on the side. 
it was a quick shot and I wasn't sure what I was seeing. Okay. I just remember them the shot of the ditch and there was nothing in it. It's just a dirt like, hole. Yeah, like covered in water, like water at the bottom. It looked like it, yeah. It looked real gross. It I did didn't look, like it. It did look real gross. I, I thought did not care for it. I thought Mulder was gonna put his hand in it. Uh me too. <laughs> me <Okay>. too. <laughs> They also find Chester, who is collecting frogs at the cemetery and sells them to Beauvais. So when they find him, they think that he's robbing graves. And the shot is weird because he's definitely digging or... Yeah, he's digging because the frogs are in the... In the mud. Mud. Yeah. And apparently the best place to find these frogs is in the the graveyard. The graveyard. It's pretty cool. They take him out to lunch after that. Yeah, and he's... He's so charismatic. I love this kid. And he's telling stories and he's like, and then Beauvais makes this disappear like my fries are disappeared. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Mulder says, I think I have, uh, what does he say? He says something like he thinks he has the, the magic remedy for that and gives him a five. And so Chester can go get some more fries. It's uh, it's freaking adorable. Oh, and he takes a big old drink of his milk and he's got this milk, milk mustache, mustache and he's just telling stories. It's it's beautiful. Ask him why he's digging up in the cemetery, and he says, Frisch born. <laughs> yes. He said the thing and the thing. This is where he says the thing and the thing. Um, at this point is when Mulder says, Scully, um, I don't know if you know, but we have been followed. And of course Scully doesn't know. Scully never knows when they're being followed. Yeah. Uh, season one, Scully was intelligent. Yeah. And fun. And I enjoyed her character. Don't care for season two, Scully. She's an idiot. Yeah. I guess she's good at autopsies. Yeah, they've really... dentistry. They've really done her dirty yeah. this season. I guess she's intelligent and unwise because she doesn't notice anything. And especially in this episode, later on, I will oh, yeah, we'll get go to into it. how fucking dumb she is. Yeah. And I, I hate it. Season yeah. one, Scully was great. Season two, Scully, terrible. And it's All the right. writers and the yeah. director. It's not Jillian Anderson. No. She's doing everything yeah. she can with she's what she's reading, done. <laughs> yeah, she's reading what's on the page. She's when she has good material, she's good and she makes the character great. Yep. And she has not had anything to work with this season. No. So what they find out is that Dunham has been following them. But Mulder spotted him in the parking lot when Chester went up to get some more fries. Mulder goes out to confront him and pulls him out of the car by his denim. I liked it. I thought There's it was a good There's so move. much denim in that shot. That's because he's from Canada. He's, he's wearing, what is it? The, a, a Canadian tuxedo. That's it. I heard um, John and Kim talking about the Canadian tuxedo on <laughs> Nightmare on Film Street podcast recently. I don't know if it was a new episode or an older one, but I was like, oh, they said it. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dunham eventually tells Mulder that Wharton has begun abusing the refugees as a means of retaliation against Beauvais. <laughs> They're is... making us do horrible things. Yes. And so this is when I said and also wrote, it's my favorite anti-military episode so far. Or was until Dee told me that we were supposed to feel bad for the Marines. And all I said was, oh. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) You totally did not understand when I said that. (laughs) Because this whole time, yeah, he's like, he's making us do things. We don't want to do it, but they're orders, so we have to. And by that, I mean we have to torture these people for question mark. I don't know why they're here. I don't know why they're being tormented. I don't know why they can't go home. Yeah, I don't remember. I know that we fucked Haiti up real bad in the 90s. Like, we've been fucking Haiti up since the inception of them. It's either us or hurricanes. Or France. Or France. Mainly France. France is pretty awful at it too, yeah. Um, But we definitely have a huge hand in it as well. And I remember the Clinton administration doing really horrible shit in Haiti. And I don't remember the specifics of it. But when we got back to this, it's it's Dunham feeling sorry for himself, saying that he's got to torment these people who don't want to be here mm-hmm. and can't leave because the military won't let them and the government won't let them. <laughs> and I was like, all right, hoorah, let's talk anti-military here. And you're <laughs> like, I think we're supposed to feel sorry for him. Yeah, we're supposed to be feel bad for the guys actually doing the beating up of people. I think that's what we're supposed to feel. I can't. Oh, I don't. I can't. My whole body (laughs) rejects that idea. No. (laughs) But it is interesting that in this scene, Dunham is, he's uncomfortable with Chester around. Chester isn't standing there, but everybody can see Chester. And Chester is, gets in the cop car, 
Scully puts him in the back, and then it's I guess it's not a cop car because he gets out. Puts him in the back of the rental. It's probably the Lariat right. rental car. There you go. And comes over to to talk to Dunham and Mulder. And Dunham's like, I ain't talking nothing with that kid here. Yeah. And I was like, Chester's great. Shut up. <laughs> Just wait. Chester runs uh, while Scully and Mulder are talking with Dunham. They chase him down, which I don't understand why. He um, was in the concentration camp, and then he got out, and then he says he goes back. So, so you know where he's going. Just let him go back. I also was conflicted because you don't want the kid out there running around alone because he might hurt himself, but you also don't want to be like, chasing him and scaring him driving full speed behind him as he's just yeah. skipping down the road i don't know how to handle it i know you don't handle it the way they did getting out of the car yelling at him chasing him through the uh the shipyard yeah i don't want him to hurt himself so let me chase him through a <laughs> shipyard where he can definitely get tetanus they did a cool shot though it's a one shot through all the shipping containers and I, stuff and i do love a good one shot you can see both of them running and then suddenly it's just Mulder. yeah it's a good shot and then at the end of the pier they show the still from a meme i've seen that i love it's Mulder looking confused at a cat <laughs> and the text says are you a ufo <laughs> which is hilarious because i've also seen that meme but I've seen Owl Kitty on YouTube where a guy puts his little black cat into a bunch of movies and it's amazing. It's mm. super fun. So if you're looking for content about cats in Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> Look up Owl Kitty. Yes. So when I first saw that meme and all, all the way until this moment, I thought it was that. I <laughs> thought he, he had put Owl Kitty into this. And then it actually showed on the screen. And it's kind of like that moment when we saw the drawing of the the Bigfoot. The Bigfoot with the titties. Yeah. And I was like, this is actually in here? Unbelievable. <laughs> it was great. I still don't believe that that's actually in there. <laughs> right. Somebody photoshopped it onto Hulu. I'm sure of it. <sighs> uh, so we don't find Chester. And then eventually they go back to the compound and Wharton denies the accusations, of course. And do you want to be Colonel Wharton or Scully? Ooh, I will be... Oh, I'll be Colonel Wharton, because I think I can do a... Because this is the part that sets up a comment you made. Yeah. And now for Cast Files Theater. Now you see what we're facing here. What kind of barbaric religion would desecrate a grave? We suspect it was an act of retaliation. Retaliation? For your mistreatment of the detainees? The hell are you talking about? Physical abuse of political refugees is a prosecutable crime under international law. <laughs> it's Beauvais, isn't it? He's the one you're getting this garbage from. Look, nobody ever said this was a hotel, but it's hardly a concentration camp. Then there is no official policy of harassment? If anything, it's my men who are being harassed. The UN, the relief organizations, they're all so busy protecting the rights of these refugees. Nobody's looking out for my men. That was Cast Files Theater. Won't somebody please think of the people with all the guns and power? I can't. Oh, they're, they're all so busy protecting the rights of these refugees. What a bunch of bastards. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, just scream. Just screaming constantly. Flames on the side of my face. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, the, it, flame, flames, flames. <gasps> oh, Jesus. <sighs> So the agents leave. Scully cuts her hand on the thorn of a twig that's left in her car. And it looks like the... Oh, you were saying how I was being all Catholic earlier. It looks like the thorns. The crown of thorns. The crown of thorns from Jesus. It is. From sexy Jesus. Sexy, sexy Jesus. And it scratches her hand. So it has her blood on it. And she just chucks it out the window. Hey, every bad people in this you know, quote-unquote evil voodoo practice. Here's some of my blood. Do with it what you will. What the hell, Scully? Well, then she drives off and there's a baby under her car. Yes, so... Who got under her car to 
Do those things was just it, magically appear? Was it Chester? Chester's... Ooh. How much space do you need to go under a car that you haven't lifted? Well, maybe they did lift it. You had four guys around it. Magic. Chester goes in and scribbles. Magic. You know what? It's all magic. It's all magic. <laughs> Warden has Beauvais beaten to death. You know. Because it's not a concentration camp and the, won't somebody think of my men. <laughs> the guy, the soldier, who we're supposed to feel bad about, is in there beating him up for no reason. Beauvais not even fighting back. No! And then... What a freaking confusing scene for me. The soldier says, well, I don't think he's able to answer any questions. That's right. You don't think. You're not paid to think. And then he objects. After he beat the shit out of the guy, then he has an objection. Fuck you, dude. Yep. Fuck you. I think what you mean to say is hoorah. Hoorah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you don't support the troops, you're a fucking bastard. Well, I guess I'm a fucking bastard because I really think that these refugees should have rights. <laughs> All people who don't support the troops are bastards. A hoorah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> you should make Wait, a t-shirt. Wait, there's a T in there somewhere. A hoorah. <laughs> <laughs> I love your... I love your new slogan. I'm going to get it tattooed all across my knuckles. Well, it's better than having a Bebe t- tattooed on your body. I'm getting that on my chest. Oh, good. I'm going full in problematic. Yikes. Mulder has a meeting with X, who tells him that he and Scully will soon be back, be called back to Washington and that the camp will be restricted to military personnel only. So, military personnel only, does that mean all of the refugees are getting to go away? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's just, we're, we're just turning it into a uh, base, the end. Yeah. And they've done this a lot. Um, whenever the agents get, air quotes, close to something, the military comes in and it's like, military only, because we've had the bodies disappear because uh-huh. they're under military jurisdiction only. What, is, what does this series think about the military? <laughs> <laughs> Unclear if I'm supposed to be on the Marine side. Yeah. And why would... The military specifically care about this one colonel who is stealing voodoo practices. They would. Why are we going to cover up for that guy? No. I guess we just cover everything up. I guess. It's just once you... That ball's rolling. You're like, God damn, I guess this is another thing. <laughs> what is my itinerary this week? Who am I covering up for today? <laughs> yeah. So the way that Mulder knows to meet X is that he found a ten of some suit. I can't remember if it was hearts or clubs or what. Yeah, it's a 10 playing card. It was a red one. I know that one. Yeah. And so Mulder knows instinctively to go to Route 10. Very good system they have. I would not have ever gotten there. Because if I could even think of... Okay, so this is obviously X wants to meet somewhere and he's got... Okay, 10. Does that mean 10 o'clock? If it means 10 o'clock, is it a.m. or (laughs) p.m.? Oh, you know what? I'm in a hotel. Maybe he wants to meet in room 10. Hmm. No. Okay. Maybe exit 10? How long would it take to get to route 10? Well, surely they set up the system before this. Do they, though? They had to have. I never hear them talking about their system. I always hear them talking about how X is not going to get himself killed for Mulder's sake, but also here's some information. And they don't get credit for anything that happens off screen. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. But I feel like I could set up a system. The black cards are for at night. The red cards are for at day. Diamonds would be interstate 10. Hearts would be route 10. County or state road 10. Whatever you're near. Okay. Mulder believes Warden is persecuting the refugees after the suicide of some of his men during a previous trip to Haiti. Which feels like placing the blame in the wrong hands. If your men are create, are, are completing suicide, shouldn't you look at your own practices to see why your men are finding that leaving this plane of existence is better than continuing to be under your command. Well, also Wharton murdered those guys too, for sure. I know. Oh, okay. (laughs) So Mulder's wrong. Let's just point out that Mulder's wrong. Only because Mulder never gets to be wrong for too long. It's always Scully. So Mulder doesn't have this correct. Okay. And he's having a good episode too. So being wrong in the middle of a good episode. And it's... Maybe that's part of... You know what? The goodness. It's his, um, it's his arc. Yeah. And I don't hate it. He's not far off. He's got... It started in Haiti. Wharton is persecuting the refugees. And he's using an excuse. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to mention earlier when he comes in at uh, Wharton, he does one of his Mulder barge throughs. And I discovered that when it's targeted correctly, I like Mulder's oh, The breakfast thing? The breakfast thing. I'm, all, I'm having my breakfast. Well, we already ate. 
It was nice. It was great. Yeah, Mulder to Wharton aggression. Good. Yeah. So when used correctly, I enjoy Mulder's bullshit. Yes. It if, just has to be targeted. Right? It has to be bullshit to bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So Scully is at her hotel. She's trying to get a hold of Durham. He's missing, and she's been trying. She's been on hold for thirty minutes or so. And she says, "I don't think you understand. I've been on hold for thirty minutes." <laughs> I'm like, ugh, remember that? Ugh, yes, I tried to call the post office the other day. Oh yesterday. yeah, yep. it sucked. And also remember that she pricked her hand on the uh, the Christ thorns. Yeah, it's bothering her. So her poison is bothering her. And she's... she's clearly poisoned. She looks at herself in the mirror, and I don't know if she's supposed to be pale or not, because she's... She's got a little bit of darkness around her eyes, and she's a bit pale. She definitely looks different. Uh, she did look different, but I was like, she always kind of looks pale, because that's just kind of her <laughs> skin tone. And then she's got the redness in her hand. She's clearly poisoned, and she's a doctor. Yeah. And she knows that people around here are being poisoned. Yeah, but she doesn't put those together. So, much like this next scene where I don't put anything together. <laughs> so, she goes to, uh, she finds out that Durham has not come back. Uh, he's been missing for, I don't know, 24 hours or whatever. And she goes to look for Mulder. She goes into Mulder's hotel room. And she's talking to him while he's clearly in the bathroom. <laughs> and then she notices that water and blood is coming under the door. So, she's obviously concerned. And she calls to him and opens the door and finds Durham dead in the bathtub. I don't know if he's been drowned or if he slit his wrists or unclear. It's not. <laughs> it's not, he's it's not unclear. <laughs> Which part's not unclear? How he died? Yeah. Yeah. Keep keep going. <laughs> oh, are all of those pieces connected? <laughs> yes, all of those pieces are connected. I see. Okay, so <laughs> it's very unclear. It's not at all. It's so unclear because then Mulder comes in uh, into his room leading McAlpin. Remember him, the zombie guy? Whose head was hanging on like a broken flower? Yes. And and he says, and he had this. And he shows Scully a bloody newspaper. With a knife in the middle of it that he clearly used to stab Durham to death. He never Dumb, saw Durham, whatever his name is. Never saw the knife. <laughs> <laughs> looked directly at <laughs> this scene and said, a newspaper? What? <laughs> it's so funny that you have no idea what's happening in here, <laughs> even though they spell it out for you directly. I, I was trying to read what was on the newspaper because I thought that was the clue. <laughs> All right, so he's carrying around a newspaper, and it's got blood on it. So this is, what does it say? Does it say, is it a list of names of people who are going to be targeted? No, nope, there's a big honking knife in the middle of it. I never saw it. I don't know what you're talking about. And this guy's dead in the bathtub, so. And who knows how he died. <laughs> <laughs> this whole scene, I was so confused, apparently. <laughs> I don't know why I was sober. <laughs> I read it. I read the whole synopsis. I read the Wikipedia page. And then I watched it and still had no idea what was happening. Oh, uh, I love doing this podcast with you. <laughs> so, so what was on the newspaper? It's apparently very important to this episode. <laughs> Oh, maybe we can find an Angel Fire website that has the zoomed in picture of that. That'd be great. So, although he has no recollection of the event, McAlpin confesses to the murder, which I guess makes this scene make more sense. <laughs> <laughs> I really like this episode, even though apparently I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> So, McAlpin confesses to the murder under the influence of Wharton, who tells the agents that Beauvais committed suicide and that their investigation is over. Which I don't think this commander can just be like, FBI, you no longer have jurisdiction because I said so. He probably can since it's military. Just, military police probably have the jurisdiction. I'm not sure. I wonder. I'm also not sure. Hmm. I never made it into the FBI. Hope I never tried. 
so I didn't make it. It was my career path for a little while. Well, you have to actually start yourself on that path. I did. That's what <laughs> I was going to college for. Okay, well, and now here you are. Doing an X-Files podcast. Yep, talking about the FBI. <laughs> Scully has a headache from the poisoning, but lies and says she's fine when she's obviously not fine. So frustrating. And also Mueller doesn't... Care? No. I'm busy. You don't look fine. I'm fine. All right. Okay, I'm going to go do something else. Mrs. McAlpin refuses to believe her husband committed the murder. Uh, Yeah, I would also because I'd be like, he was dead two days ago and now he (laughs) came back as a zombie and then he's committing murder and now he's confessing to it. Something's off. <laughs> something. This is a little suspicious. Something's something. Can't put my finger on it, but something's off. Apparently he came by the, the house the night before and said, if anything happens to me, give the feds this photo. It's a very good photo. So McAlvin's wife provides the agents with a photo of Wharton and Beauvais. They're together in a crowd of people in Haiti. It doesn't look like they're hanging out together. It doesn't. It looks like they're in a crowd of people <laughs> in the same crowd of people. Yeah. They're not standing near, ne- they're standing near each other, not standing next to each other. Warden is behind Beauvais. Neither one of them are looking at each other. They're looking at something else. It's kind of like if you took a picture of people standing beside a crowd, or not a crowd, a, um, a parade, and you were on the parade, and in the parade and you took a picture of the crowd and you were like all of these people know each other right like for sure these people know each other like the selfies we take at gasparilla yes (laughs) anybody behind us is our best friend yep we've got lots of them (laughs) so this makes the the agents i don't know go look at warden's stuff so they go through his office they find that both dunham and is it dunham or durham i've written both who knows (laughs) And <laughs> McAlvin have filed complaints against Wharton over his treatment of the detainees. Didn't they ask if anybody had filed complaints? And he was like, we're not, we're not proud of it, but no. Yeah, uh, he, no, they didn't ask if anybody had filed complaints. They just asked if anything bad was happening. And he said no, mm. because of course he would. No, Dunham, outside at the car. Oh, I don't He remember. says... Yeah, none of us are very proud that we haven't done anything, but this is what's happening. Yeah, I don't don't remember. Well, I remember that scene, so I don't know what's happening with the newspaper, the bloody newspaper, <laughs> but I know what happened at that car. <laughs> There's chicken feet in one of the drawers, and it, they're punctured through a piece of paper, so Jillian Anderson doesn't have to touch them. <laughs> but she holds up the paper with the chicken feet through it. I wonder how many times they had to take that. So that the chicken feet would stay in the paper. Right. It was, it was wild. Whatever. It was unnecessary. (laughs) It was weird. Nobody's wearing gloves, of course. Mm. I don't want to touch chicken feet, but I also don't want to be in a scene where we have to use actual chicken feet. Yeah, chicken feet aren't slimy or anything. They would just be, they'd be like, they'd be scaly. I know they're not actual scales, but they're It'd be kind of like like holding a stick. It's true. It's fine. The agents head to the cemetery. Uh, where Wharton is performing a voodoo rite over Beauvais' coffin. Let's be honest. It's bold when you know the feds are still in town. Yeah, it is bold. Uh, Mulder comes in and says, Federal agent! And it's at this point in the podcast, I have to admit to everybody that every time one of these guys yells federal agent, my brain immediately goes mad because I'm flagrant. Tap my cell and my phone in the basement. My team supreme, stay clean. Triple beam, lyrical dream. I be that. Great. <laughs> when Mulder confronts him, Wharton harms him through sympathetic magic. How it's do you... not called voodoo doll? Nope. <laughs> How do you feel about the abusive American guy appropriating a Haitian religious ritual? I mean, if he's doing it right, he's just participating. Like, his magic works. It does. It's very interesting. Yeah. I'm... Also unclear about, I guess he, be- I mean, he has to believe, otherwise it's not going to work. Yeah. Because that's how magic works. Hmm. Or religion. I feel like even if you believe in like regular religion, it still doesn't work. Well, so, I mean, voodoo is a religion. I know. They don't see it as magic. That's true. Yeah. I don't know. It's happening and working. So clearly he's doing it the way you're supposed to do it. Yeah. Is it? appropriation at that point i don't know but i was also curious about what sympathetic magic was 
Is voodoo doll like a derogatory term or something? I don't know. But that's what the notes said from the X-Files fan archive site. Okay. So I was like, okay, what does this mean? Sympathetic magic is primitive or magical ritual using objects or actions resembling or symbolically associated with the event or person over which influence is sought. Mm-hmm. So a voodoo doll, mm-hmm. now that you've asked if that's a derogatory term, I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, but is part of sympathetic magic. So that makes sense. Okay, so it's just like one bit of this grander thing. Yeah. Okay. It's an example of okay. this thing. So we all learned something. Good for us. And the production. Uh, near the end of the episode, when Colonel Wharton is in the cemetery, he speaks in an incantation in Creole, which is a Haitian dialect of French. And there are no subtitles, but it can be translated as to the saints, to the moon, to the stars. Yeah, my two years of French in high school, I knew what he was saying. No, you didn't. Yeah, I did. You didn't say it to me. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, meanwhile, in a hallucinatory episode, a man emerges out of Scully's hand. And it's the guy that accosted her in the camp earlier this episode. Oh. Uh Uh-huh. The lighting was different. Yeah, it was. Also, oh man, so she's looking in the mirror, she's sitting in the car while Mulder's out in the cemetery, and she's, she looks in the mirror, and then she like opens her lips, and you can tell that her mouth is full of blood, and she then it bites looks- a blood capsule. <laughs> and then it look, it, the camera, instead of being in the mirror, looks at her face, and her mouth is just- bloody and then she looks at her hand and it starts oozing and i love that it starts oozing clear oh it was amazing it was so much better than if it had started oozing blood to me because (laughs) that means there's something in there yeah it is way grosser and then it really is and then fingers start coming out of her hand oh just poke it out amazing so that was the guy that accosted her at the beginning but then, spoiler alert, we find out that Chester's also not real. Right. So that guy is also a spirit. Who's... That's why Chester was able to, like, grab him and get him away. Because Chester's, like, a good spirit. Did anybody touch Chester? Yes, Mulder grabbed Chester. Did he? And I believe Scully touched him when she was guiding him into the car. Okay. And he does eat french fries. They disappear. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Through magic. He said it was magic. <laughs> Man, I will buy any child more fries who was like, and then they disappeared. (laughs) (laughs) All right, you with your cute little milk mustache, I got you. Uh, So that's crazy. The guy comes out of her hand and is strangling her. She sees the good luck charm that Mulder purchased from Chester earlier. Mm -hmm. They had hung it from the rearview mirror and she struggles to reach it. But once she touches it, The man inhabiting her body disappears. (laughs) The man in her hand. And then she's fine. Yeah, she's not poisoned anymore. She's protected. It was wild how fine she was because she comes out and she sees Mulder. There's a little bit that happens with Mulder between the time that Mulder and Scully reconvene. But when she comes out, she says, she says something like Mulder looks, she hopes Mulder feels better than he looks or something. And she's fine. (laughs) Yeah. She's been poisoned for Six hours. <laughs> Half the episode. Uh, but, okay, so back out in the cemetery, Beauvais appears and stops Wharton by blowing zombie powder in his face. But first he says, okay, I'm gonna, oh, do you want to do this with your two years of high school French? Saki uh, fait mal. C'est mal. Les oui? I don't know that one. Uh, he who does evil, evil he will see. That's what he does. That's what he says, and then he blows the powder in the guy's face. Scully arrives to assist Mulder and pronounces Warden dead. But remember earlier, not you guys, because I did not mention it, but do you remember earlier in the episode when she said it was gross negligence pronouncing McAlpin dead? Uh Uh-huh. And then Scully looks at Warden and says, he dead. (laughs) She doesn't touch him. No, doesn't check for a pulse or anything. She looks at him with her eyeballs. Her eyeballs that have been poisoned for the last at least six hours. But she did that in Lazarus also. <laughs> and she said, oh, he did. So the next day the agents say goodbye to McAlpin, who reveals that Chester was a boy who had died 50 years ago. <laughs> Just kidding. Six weeks earlier in a riot. Yeah, because the we're quote, in, riot. Yes, because we're using all of these terms to denote that these are the bad people, even though they're just dog whistles. 
The episode ends with Warden being unwittingly buried alive by the graveyard watchman. It's so good. This is the best ending to an episode we've had in a long time. I can't tell you when. Yes. Probably since season one. Yes. And the best, I think the best part is the dog knows he's alive. (laughs) It's great. So the watchman has a dog, a dog companion with him. And the dog is looking into the grave and whining. Yeah. And is very stressed out about it. It's good and the watchman just calls the dog by his name he's like hey get out of the way i'm i'm putting some <laughs> I'm dirt in here burying a guy alive get out of the way and so then he just you know I, we assume the dog moves because we don't see that part but then he puts um a load of dirt into on top of the coffin and then the camera's inside the coffin and we see warden is alive oh ah. chef's kiss Mwah. Ah, it's so good this is the award for the most satisfying ending yes it's great. It's so good. All right. So finally, an episode that we got behind, even though apparently I didn't understand a third one. <laughs> Who are you shipping? Uh, Chester and those fries. Nice. I am shipping that cat and some belly rubs. Oh, yay. Which I think is also Chester. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> so, oh, which we didn't say. Um, when the hallucination guy disappears because scully touches the charm Mm -hmm. the safety charm oh yeah the cat's on the car yep yeah the cat appears so it was an owl kitty episode (laughs) yes (laughs) how are you surviving i am going to let my partner know that i have been poisoned that's great yes i'm also not going to throw that out of the car right so when i get when i get stabbed by jesus christ's thorns I'm keeping the thorns with me, and then, I don't know, maybe going to urgent care? This is the United States, so i I got to be careful about where I go, but... Uh, She is a government employee, though. Oh, true. She gets government health care, which is nice. Okay, so yes, I would go get checked out. Excellent. At the very least, I would still keep it with me, go wash my hands with soap and water, and put maybe some Neosporin on it, because it is a pretty deep, nasty puncture. Yeah. you got to figure out how to demystify it. Do you burn it? Because my immediate thought was, oh, I burned this thing so nobody can have my blood. But maybe then burning the thing with your blood on you hurts you. So you got to figure out how to do it. Yeah. Keep it hermetically sealed until you figure out what to do with it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. How are you surviving? I am surviving. uh, Don't be a white guy doing voodoo. Oh, yes. You cannot get that (laughs) tattoo then. We're back to you not getting that tattoo. Damn it. Yep. You can get that other tattoo across your knuckles. What was it? Ow, what good tab. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. All right. And that is it for us this week. The Cast Files is produced by Kristen Riley and Dave Reed. Edited by Dave Reed. You can find us on Twitter at Cast Files. You can find me on Twitter at Dave Reed. That's D A I V E R E E D. You can email us at The Cast Files. That's the with two E's at gmail.com. If you could please go rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, give us five stars and tell us that we are doing phenomenal things. Artistic, wonderful things. We are raising the bar on podcasting. We would love you forever for that. We have a Tee Public store. You can go buy t-shirts and stuff there. Music by Hal Six. Logo by Art. That's O-O-K-A-R-T. 